Welcome to Drive for Service, a podcast to inspire higher quality of service. Welcome everybody to our next episode of Drive for Service. My name is Melania Battison and I'm the Ed Sommelier, a wine buyer at Medlar Restaurant in Chelsea in London. And next to me, David O'Connor, the co-owner and restaurant manager of Medlar Chelsea. Hello everyone. Today, we are delighted to welcome our next guest. Yes, so today we're meeting Thomas Koch, the Managing Director of the Corinthia. So Thomas, tell us how you started your career. Well, how far do you want me to go back? I sometimes wonder whether I started almost as a child. Um, I was very lucky that my family traveled a lot and took us to a lot of restaurants. And um, we always cooked at home and ate together. And in, in early days, there was an interest for all things like setting tables, clearing, cooking, and, um, you know, and seeing activity in restaurants and so on. My mother always complains that I wanted to sit by the kitchen entrance because they, of course, wanted to sit by the window, as you can imagine. And, um, <laughs> but I, I, I don't know if you can call this a career start. Um, in my teenage years, I, um, I worked as a waiter on the weekend and, um, you know, like the world around me often said, like, why do you do this? You know, like, why don't you just take the school holidays and you do two weeks solid, earn a little bit of money and so on. But I actually really loved it. I honestly enjoyed working in the team and and being with people. So, you know, and, and, and then it went on and on. And there was a bit of a decision time, you know, when you finish school and you're 18, 19. I was obviously educated and born in Germany and... Um, Back in the days, you still had to do military service and so on. And so at this point, I was a little divided because I wasn't sure whether I really loved hotels or whether I wanted to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. So family, eldest son, guess where this all went? Oh, no? like <laughs> <laughs> the proud moment, eldest son is a doctor. So I started studying medicine. And um, I did this in Cologne. I mean, this must have been like 1992. So the hotel world in Germany back then wasn't really what it is in London or in New York or in Hong Kong today. So um, there were a few very, very nice historic hotels and it was a beautiful city and I was studying medicine and I was, you know, it was... It was something that I enjoyed, but I found I didn't really love it. And there was something in me that told me, Thomas, this isn't it. You will, you will never finish this. And, um, and I made a very brave decision and I stopped this university course, mm -hmm. basically. And I, I said, no, I'm going to follow my heart and I'm going to pursue a career in hotels. So I started an apprenticeship uh, with a company called Steigenberger, which was back then one of the leading hotel companies in Germany. And I really learned the business from the, the bottom up, really. I mean, an apprenticeship scheme lasts about two and a half years. You're in housekeeping, in the kitchen, in front office, in events, in service, just everywhere. And, and, and that's how it started. And it was the absolutely right decision. Um, you know, as you then grow and mature, you, you form thoughts like, so when I'm 50 and when I look back, mm -hmm. I don't want to have regrets. So this point in my life has been reached a little while ago. I did look back. <laughs> I had no regrets. So that was clearly the right decision. Nice. Um, yeah, and then, um, you know, the career kind of developed almost um, a little bit organically. And I feel, you know, when you're really committed and if you have a goal and if you have something in your mind that you want to reach, you probably intuitively make the right decision. So I worked in a number of restaurant positions. Uh, then I started studying again. Um, so I studied in Munich, business economics. So I, I have an MBA. And um, after Munich, there was a decision whether to go to New York or to London. Um, so I sent four applications to New York, four applications to London. Two weeks later, I had three job offers in London and I haven't heard back from New York. And the rest yeah. is history. It was meant to be. And here I am, 23 years later. Um, London has been an incredible city. I, I came here with Hyatt, uh, with Park Hyatt, yeah. and I started at the Carlton Tower, which is now a Jumeirah. My career then was in events. Um, 
I then joined the Savoy Group at the Barclay, uh, first as uh, banqueting manager. I loved that job. That was one of my favorite jobs, I must say. Um, what is a banqueting manager? Organizing uh, the the events, banquets. Um. Okay. Yeah, organizing the events. And um, I mean, I got a lot of people married. <laughs> You know, you do weddings, you do birthday parties, you do bar mitzvahs, you do corporate events. And it, it was really good fun. The career then developed uh, to food and beverage uh, director. And I had the opportunity to work with some incredible chefs, uh, you know, back, back in the days at the Barclay. Do you remember Wong? Mm -hmm. John Josh Wong Gerichten, which was an incredible restaurant. Pierre Kaufman was there mm -hmm. with his La Tante Claire. Um, so the years went by, the Connaught was part of the group, um, the Connaught then closed and was refurbished. Um, after my food and beverage post, I went there during the opening as hotel manager. Uh, amazing memories opening this fantastic hotel and I met Helena Rose and we created the Connaught Bar and the Coburg Bar. I, I guess I was asked to go there because of my food and beverage background and, um, so I had some very, very happy years at the Connaught. And then came Claridge's. Um, first as hotel manager, the then general manager, um, who, who I liked a lot. He was so much fun to work with. Philippe Leboeuf is his name. Uh, he kind of left me six months into the assignment and went to <laughs> Paris. And I said, thought, okay, au revoir, Philippe. Um, so uh, like the search for a general manager started and oh. I you know, joined the application process and, and I was really super lucky that I, that I got the job. And then I had six years as general manager at Claridge's, which was of course uh, like an incredible time, really sort of forming years. Um, and then, um, I, I, I mean, of course everything has to come to an end <laughs> and, um, because I, at this point I also have been, had been with Maybourne, that's the hotel group yeah. operating Barclay, yeah. Connaught and Claridge's uh, for 15 years. Um, the CEO at the time, his name is Stephen Alden, uh, was a really like, yeah, like a role model for me, an incredible luxurian in a way. Um, he had also left. Um, I had a year at the Cafe Royal, but the Corinthia mm -hmm. then came about. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the Corinthia is like a wonderful company, family owned. And uh, the CEO, Simon Naudi, called and the founder and chairman, Alfred Pisani, called. And we had meetings and meetings. And at some point I couldn't resist. And I joined there six years ago. And et voila, that's where we are. Right. Fantastic. What a story. <laughs> I know. So along the way, I mean, um, there must have been some people along the way that taught you this job or did you sort of learn yourself on, you know, by experience or? Well, I mean, you know, it's interesting because don't you find that in our industry, there isn't like this school model, no, you're never really being sat down and told. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of things you just learn as you go along. I mean, you make your experiences, the good ones, when your heart jumps and you and you think, yes, I love this industry. And the bad ones, you know, where you burn your fingers a little bit and you maybe think like, hmm, how could this happen? That was horrible. And it makes you grow. And um, today I say to, you know, younger colleagues in our industry, um, being ambitious and you know, being really, really focused on what you want is incredible, but there's one thing you can't fast track and that's experience. Mm -hmm. You just need to live your life a little bit. And with the years you get a little wiser and a little bit more experienced. Mm -hmm. um, and you meet a lot of colleagues who do things really well, you know, like mm -hmm. I, I, I still learn, I feel every day, but those people don't necessarily have to be more senior mm -hmm. or they don't necessarily have to be older. Sometimes it's also the younger people who have an incredible talent or who surprise you and yeah. you, and you look at like a man or a woman in your, in your sort of group of colleagues and you think, wow, that's fascinating. That's really cool. So I, I feel to answer your question, this this learning has happened uh, on on many many levels. Mm. What is the thing that you enjoy the most about hotellery or hospitality, based on your story? I'm what I, you know, what I really enjoy is yeah. to see other people enjoying what we do, and I think that's really important for people who join hospitality because if you don't care about how other people feel, 
I would really say it's the wrong business. <laughs> you, you should, you should maybe, you should maybe try to do something else. But, but I do, and um, you know, to see people. I mean, it doesn't matter in what part. You know, if you work in reception and people check out and they say they had the most amazing stay, that makes me happy. Or if you work in a restaurant and they really enjoy their time and you can see that they're connecting at a table and they're enjoying the food and hopefully there's a bit of a relationship mm -hmm. built with the person who looks after that table. I enjoy this. Um, so now my work, I, I guess there is an evolution to everything. So I'm maybe not um, as involved in the direct frontline operation so much anymore, but nonetheless, my mind, of course, evolves around guest experiences all day long. And today it's maybe more creating experiences on a slightly more conceptual level, like the, the strategic approach on how you can develop um, a style, a tone, a point of view to the hotel that I'm looking after. And and I guess that's the same in, in any hospitality business, if it's a restaurant or a bar or a pub or a hotel. I mean, there is a lot of competition in mm -hmm. London mm -hmm. and people have an awful lot of choices. But why would they choose to stay at Corinthia? What makes us different? What, what, what is it that, you know, maybe sets us apart or that moves us away from this big, big middle ground into an ever so slightly more extreme position that maybe even there's a risk that some people may not like it, but therefore you also know that other people will love it even more. Mm -hmm. So this is the work I do today. And to position this hotel, to create an offering that guests can choose and to um, surround yeah, myself or to equip the hotel with a team that delivers that um, wholeheartedly, passionately, yeah. lovingly, professionally. <laughs> I, I mean, in, in in many, many different ways. Well, that moves us on to sort of the next point. I mean, mm -hmm. what is, um, Thomas, tell us the importance of service for you. Okay, I don't know that there is a word for it. <laughs> um, I, so, it, 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 in my opinion, it's probably the most important element. I'm not saying that other factors aren't important. Well, I would imagine in a five-star hotel, that is the difference maker from your competition is, is a service element, I would say. In our particular case, I would like to say so. Mm -hmm. um, but if you just take one step back, there may be brands that position mm -hmm. themselves through other means. Like there are very, very design-led yeah. brands. There are very, very... Um, yeah, extremely culinary-led uh, mm -hmm. brands, um, but but absolutely. And I think it's also the most enjoyable element yeah. to differentiate yourself through mm -hmm. service. Um, but if it's a hotel or a restaurant, you know, the design, of course, can be incredible. The um, comfort can be incredible. But if the service and if the um, level on which people engage and connect with you isn't really remarkable... Um, I think that would be um, probably one of the most important factors for to, uh, to, to have an enjoyable experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you um, recruit uh, the team as well at Corinthia? Yeah, we recruit. I mean, the recruitment process is quite, um, <laughs> quite organized. So right. there are many, many levels that a candidate has to go through. Uh, so first your application is screened, but then you see a, a member from the HR team, then you would normally see the head of department next, then you see the division head next. And then as a final stage, you would see either the hotel manager or myself. I see. So that, of course, sounds um, <laughs> streamy. Yeah, yeah, okay, it's but terrible. we try to be really, really quick because mm. uh, today, if you spot a talent and if you mm. have someone who you really like, yeah. I mean, let's be honest. After all these years, you kind of see a person and you know, like, yes, you're yeah. it. I want you. Or you're right. Or we are right. Because it works both ways, mm. uh, doesn't it? I'm, yeah. You know, it's not only us looking. It's also the person looking. It's uh, somebody's life. It's, it's their career. But, um, you know, sometimes um, the biggest mistake, in my opinion, that we can make when we recruit is to recruit out of desperation. Mm -hmm. It's really not two arms and two legs that we're looking for. Yeah. 
I mean, it's <laughs> it would be very helpful <laughs> to have these uh, two arms and two legs. But what we're really looking for is, of course, the heart, the character, the healthy mind, the ambition, the yeah, the love for the business. I mean, that is, of course, the ultimate if you find this in a person. So do you look for that or do you, do you have a way to, to, to sort of implement or train that in a way as well? Or A little like, bit of both. Because yeah. um, sometimes you can switch on a spark in people to embrace the culture, if you like. Sometimes you can. Um, and I think we should try that every day. Um, it's a, so, so this uh, for me is a bit of a tricky question because I, I do believe that you can train everything if somebody wants to learn and if mm -hmm. somebody is really excited about the prospect of learning. And I do believe this. And then there comes the little however. <laughs> 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 however, a little bit of pedigree mm -hmm. isn't a bad thing in our world. Um, because if you have a big team, so in our hotel, we're working with 500 people. I mean, honestly, looking at the hotel now, to have 500 people who are just there because they decided that this might be a good idea. And yes, Corinthia, and yes, Thomas and team, take me, teach me, and I'll be great. It just doesn't work like this. You need to have a little bit of uh, technical excellence in there, a little bit of pedigree, a little bit of experience. And you know, ha having said this, if you think about it, it's actually quite a natural process because there are many, many people who know very early in their life that this is what they want to do. And they make their choices in early days. And those are the people that we see growing in our industry. And those are the people who will most likely make an incredible career because, you know, sometimes what's deeply ingrained in you doesn't just suddenly come to you at some point. Often you have that in you from your early days. And I'm looking for those people as well. Mm -hmm. I see. Right. Can you, do, do you, do you agree or do you disagree? <laughs> Absolutely agree, yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's amazing. I'm just trying to figure out how you, how you, how you do it with this recruitment, but uh, I guess that's... Uh, so, but with recruitment, it's an interesting one. Um, I, I mean, obviously, we're coming out of an exceptionally difficult mm -hmm. time. And um, I do remember that at the end of last year, so we're in 2023 now, so end of 2022, um, I felt that there was a moment where I had to call my management team together and actually to display a little bit of leadership. Mm -hmm. you, you know, obviously, leading a hotel is an incredibly democratic process, and there are a lot of people who who have uh, super important things to contribute, but sometimes you also need to give a little bit of direction. And the direction at that meeting was, I really do not want to talk about the pandemic anymore. Mm -hmm. I do not want to drown in the misery of the past, and I don't want to hear about Brexit anymore. Mm -hmm. Um Instead, I would like to look forward and I would like to talk about things that we should be talking about, being exceptional, creating exceptional service experiences, being the best hotel in London or whatever your purpose or your um, ambition is. I mean, in our case, of course, we want to be the leading hotel in London, just like I'm sure you want to be like the leading restaurant uh, in, in London. Um and it was quite fascinating because it changed the conversation and it shifted the mindset because all these recruitment issues and all these staff shortages and all this complaining about it really doesn't move us forward. Mm -hmm. So instead, we were trying to shift this into um, a realm of positivity and, and, and almost being magnetic by not talking about the mm -hmm. past and not talking okay. about the bad stuff, but just... You know, it's not that there are no waiters in London. There are waiters. We just need to make sure that they work for us. <laughs> so easier said than done, 100%. Yeah. I mean, it's easy for me to sit here and to say this, but if you don't, I mean, if you really, really want it, you will probably get it. No, mm -hmm. like, I mean, if you just say like, yeah, we need, we need staff, that's not enough. Mm -hmm. You just need to be a little bit better than that. I think if you create an environment where people are looked after, where people can learn, where people work in an inspirational environment. So this is uh, an example. The inspirational environment, in my opinion, is very much the responsibility of an executive team. 
I mean, the executive team at the hotel is an, is an incredible team. They all have wonderful experiences. So expose yourself. Mm. You know, get out there. Use your industry contacts. Be, uh, you know, be important to the people who work with us and who are in the hotel. Share, talk, engage. Um, you know, this may. Um, I I am aware that as I'm as I'm saying this to you, that it might all sound a little idealistic. But if you actually think about it. In time, it will have an effect. In time, like the positivity with which you enter the market or the positivity with which you, um, uh, you know, present your company to the employment world will be noted. It will be noted in interviews uh, when, when they ask their questions. And the responsibility, of course, is also very much with me. Mm -hmm. um, I am a trustee in a service scheme called the Gold Service Scholarship. Um, this is a scheme which is uh, which has been created to support young, talented um, hospitality staff. So, you know, it's not good enough for someone like me to just look at an organization like that and say, like, yeah, fabulous, good job, well done. <laughs> you know, you have to you have to yeah. give time and yes. you have to be in that world and in this network. So I meet the contestants, we're hosting the finals, um, you, you know, and I've, I've been doing this for the last 10 years. That's just one example. You could argue that the uh, TV programs that the hotels that I worked uh, for um, have helped as well. Because it's very easy. Like, I mean, if I wanted to be an actor, I would live in Los Angeles and I would have gone to acting school. I don't. I'm a hotelier and I'm a passionate service person, but these TV programs, of course, expose our world and they show people who are not in our world how wonderful it is and how varied careers can look like. And that, for example, is my responsibility in the recruitment world. Yeah, totally agree. I mean, um, that is probably how we recruit as well, is, is projecting mm. this positivity of what, of what we do. I mean, a slightly different to you, I don't really need that sort of technical pedigree so much in what we do but um i, I sort of look at whether we whether we like the per them as a person or not and can i see this person looking after our guests and if the answer is yes then yeah exactly yeah mm. yeah i agree and for example like uh, what is your like sort of management style i mean does it change based on the people that you have in front or may i say like for example i don't know you're you kind of being like caring to them or like you're a bit more strict and you know uh, how, how, what is your management style like? What do you want me to say, yeah, Melania? Yeah, I, 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 I think know, I try, I'm a, how, I'm how a do, loving, caring person. I know you are. This is how you look. Tom, Thomas, how do you implement those standards? Because I know it's not easy to be Mr. Nice Guy exactly, all the time. Yeah. To, uh, I think this is where I wanted to get in a, in a different way. Why don't you just ask what you really want to ask? <laughs> You, you know, management style is also something that you improve, I think, with time. But what, you know what I do feel is quite important is that I'm a solid force in the business and that I am reliable to the world around me. You know, it cannot be that people come into the hotel in the morning thinking, what is he going to be like today? Mm. You know, what will mm. we get? Will we get the happy Thomas or will we get the, uh, no, you know, the good. obsessed Thomas or whatever? I think that's that's just not right. So mm. at the end of the day, I think I'm just trying to be normal. I'm just trying to be me. And I don't want to put um, a face or a mask on when I'm in the business. I think people know me and they can know part of my private life and they know my and they know my professional views and they know my obsessions and they know the areas where I can be extremely gray and extremely flexible. And then they also know the parts where it's pretty black and white and the non-negotiables. <laughs> and what are those? And what are those? <laughs> Tell us. <laughs> we'll get to that later. Okay. <laughs> okay. I wanted to ask you also, I think you touched a really good point when you started your career that you mentioned about seeing all the departments of, um, of the hotel where you used to work in. Does it still happen, like, is it still happening in Corinthia or the previous hotel where you've been working? Have you always looked at every single, like, from room service to banquet? 
So I feel that I know pretty well what's go what's going on in the hotel. So am I in room service taking an order or setting a trolley up to, to, to go up to, to one of the rooms for breakfast? Probably not. But I am. Um, so this is what my team sometimes complains about a little bit. They mm. maybe feel that I'm a little bit too involved, but I try to explain this because it's not really uh, wanting to overly micromanage or to control. It's it's literally like it's my job. No, it's my job to know. <laughs> I, <laughs> so, so, so that's it. And all I'm asking for is to communicate. And if mistakes happen, absolutely fine. No one should ever worry about reprimands or anything like this, but we need to talk about it. And we then need to try to go to the root cause because what we do is also not rocket science. I think if you put a healthy mind to it and if you if you know what's going on and knowing what's going on is not only operational, it's also knowing what's going on with your people. Mm. Um, you, you know, this whole idea of um, I leave my private life at home and at work, I'm super professional. Hmm, not so sure. Uh, I, I think people are people. And um, someone once said to me, like, what do you get when you squeeze an orange? Orange juice. If you squeeze it at home or if you squeeze it at work, it will always be orange juice. So, you know, a person is a person. And if you have a holistically happy life, um, then, then that will probably project on work. But those are things that in today's day and age, we need to know as well. And for that, I think you need to be genuinely interested because it comes back to the care, doesn't it? Like if you don't yeah. care about what's going on with your people or if you're not genuinely interested, then then you might as well not ask. Yeah. I mean, I think this is the final, like to wrap up, let's say you mentioned about consistency before. Am I going to have the happy Thomas? I'm going to have the sad Thomas, let's say, because sometimes you can have a bad day in your private life. But I guess like at the end, what really drives you for service is like the passion that you have and like the genuinity that you approach. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, like, it, I think it's a skill and it's a talent that many, many people have. And, um, that's the skill that they bring to our world of hospitality. Um, you know, some people have the skill of dancing or singing or writing, and we maybe have that skill of looking after people and creating moments. So service is a, is a tricky thing. No, it's, it's, it's nothing that we can write down. So sometimes when we talk about service at the hotel, I try to make it a little bit more tangible. And, you know, going back to school, when they tell you, you can only manage what you can measure. There's an element of truth in there, because if you can't talk precisely or accurately about how you would like the service to feel or how you would like the service to be or the tone to be, then people can't be sure what's right or what's wrong or, you know, what's maybe the service style that's wanted for this particular hotel. So, um, so one of our principles is, is that of operational excellence. And then I break it down into three different areas because what, because what is operational excellent, excellence? You know, here you are 22 years old, you come to London and you work in a big hotel and they tell you, we would like exceptional service. <laughs> you know, okay, <laughs> off you pop. <laughs> it doesn't work like this. So, so a little bit of, 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 of a model is, is very helpful. So in our induction, we start talking about this. And then there is a very repetitive way of um, repeating a few key elements. So we talk a lot about uplifting moments, for example. I can, I can tell you about uplifting moments a little later. We talk a lot about the spirit of generosity. We talk a lot about making people feel better. And we also talk a lot about operational excellence. And with operational excellence, it probably all starts. So because to be operationally excellent, it's not just the service delivery. Th there is more to it. So we then talk about technical excellence aesthetic excellence and emotional excellence. And that's very, very easy. And for you, you will absolutely know already what I mean. But technical excellence is really doing things correctly. Uh, you know, if you sit in a restaurant and you see 
a beautifully choreographed service where things happen correctly. There is no stain on the cutlery. The glasses are polished. It's all in the right place. It's served the way we learned it in Lausanne. Um, you know, the food has the right temperature. It's 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 cooked beautifully. It's technically excellent. That uh, excellent. That's of course extremely enjoyable. But will that make people say it was amazing? Because what if the aesthetic excellence isn't right? Just imagine you have the air conditioning in your neck. It's freezing cold. Or the music is so loud that you can't hear what the person is saying. Or maybe the style of the person who looks after you isn't right. You know, all right, dude. <laughs> you know, was, was that good? Or like the language they use. Or the tie is half down. Or the fingernails are dirty. Or, or, or. Like, I mean, there are aesthetic elements to service which can destroy the experience. It can also be technically awful and the ambience is incredible and the aesthetics are incredible. So you can already see, and I, I think even people who aren't professional, at this point in the narrative, people will see how these different elements come together. And then, of course, the third component that I mentioned was the emotional excellence. And that's mm -hmm. where you really connect with people. And that's where you get this sort of warm, fuzzy feeling that makes you come back. So that's another point, like why, at least one reason to come back. So Be may, may yeah. I ask, how do you encourage um, your team to do that last bit you just said there? Because that is something that's virtually impossible to teach. You need them to think for themselves um, in, in, in you know, reading the customer. So how do you encourage and reward that element? Because I know it does happen in your hotel, for example. It starts by talking about it mm -hmm. and it almost starts, starts by opening their minds and actually showing them what's possible. So this um, is the most difficult one, the emotional excellence, but mm -hmm. it comes with um, being alert, observing your environment, um, you know, spotting an opportunity to do something for people that touches them in their hearts. Um, and it's very, very easy, you know, if it's a birthday celebration, if there is a child around, if there is a dog around. I mean, it really isn't very difficult in our world to emotionally touch, mm -hmm. in inverted commas, people. Um, but those opportunities need to be celebrated when those moments happen. So those th that would lead me to the uplifting moments. Um, when those moments happen, I think we need to recognize them. We need to remember them and we need to celebrate them. And we, of course, also need to give people the empowerment to actually perform them and maybe also allow them to make a mistake here or there. Mm -hmm. You know, because sometimes you don't read people in the right way and maybe sometimes you almost did a little bit too much because some people yeah. want to be left alone. But mm -hmm. that's a learning yeah. curve and that's okay. You know, we don't perform open heart yeah. surgery. No one dies. Mm -hmm. It's okay. <laughs> so, no, but I think, it, you know, from my experience of the hotel, it, you certainly feel all of that and particularly the attention to detail as well, which is, uh, you know, inspires that confidence and, and the staff are, you know, the, 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 they make you feel so good there as well. I think that's amazing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's very nice 100%. of you to say that when you say they make you feel so good. Um, but it's, it's in addition to the other things as well. Everything is, you know, on point. It's the attention to detail I always find yeah, very impressive. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. We try. I mean, no, as to be honest, like, I now I remember my experience at the Korean team. We went there for afternoon tea uh, to celebrate someone's birthday, if I'm not mistaken. And it was just, uh, it was amazing. It's like, how can they be like so professional and how can they be so, you know, easygoing? The people, they didn't make you feel like, oh, you're such an, even though the environment was incredibly beautiful, like they didn't make you feel like, oh, you're in a really posh place. You should behave like a posh person. Mm. Like, you know, like they make you feel like at home. They make you feel like really, yeah, it was so natural. It was beautiful. Well, that's really important to us that you um, get absolutely everything you want yeah. without um feeling that it's a very formal or staged environment I so posh, that's perhaps uh, formal was a better word <laughs> or like super posh <laughs> like you know like i yeah, mean but, what's but posh some, what's elegant in, in top hotels or top restaurants it can feel very contrived and yeah, just you know it, it doesn't have the same feel but uh mm. i think it's really important um to listen to you and how you explained it it's brilliant yeah, yeah. um so i mean thomas the, moving on to customers i mean develop Developing relationship with customers for regular visits. I mean, oh, yeah. it's, tell us how you do that for your hotel. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Um, I, you, you, you may remember that I mentioned this reason to come back before. Yes. I think that's an, that's an important focus. Um, be, because like if you, if you look back at the evolution of hospitality, like of course we landed in the big wild world of experiences. You no, know, like everybody wants an experience. Um, but what's a good experience? What's a bad experience? Because experience people aren't very rational about. You no, know, no one walks into a restaurant and says, okay, the door was opened for me, 10 out of 10. There was someone mm. at the cloakroom, took my coat, again, 10 out of 10. Um, oh, my table wasn't ready. I had to wait five minutes. That's a five. So I'm on a seven. You know, so, so, so this is not how people go about experiences. Mm. I think people remember when we stop them in their tracks when we deliver a significant moment that was for them. And that is what creates loyalty. I think if you realize that great service can mean a hundred different things to a hundred different people, and if you build this on a solid and robust foundation, because, because you know I'm obsessed with standards, but not in a robotic way. I just really believe that standards are a great foundation to then start dancing. But you need to know the steps first. And, and you know, if everybody, you know, if we decide to dance a tango and everybody does different steps, then, then it won't yeah. work. No? So, like, so, so this is why I really try to make everybody understand that standards are not restrictive and they're not created to make people robotic. They are really liberating. They are there to communicate what we do. It's like when we get into our cars after this and drive through London, there are standards to driving on, on the street. And, mm -hmm. and I think, again, if you change your viewpoint a little bit there and if you build this robust foundation and then you almost have a little bit more mind space free to create loyalty and to really look after your customers. And you don't have to be overly sort of worried, oh my God, how much wine do I put in the glass? Uh, uh, you know, you know, when do I remove the bread plate or whatever it may be? You know, those things are just routine and they're just done effortlessly. I think that's a key word. Service needs to feel effortless then you can start creating loyalty because then you have time for a conversation and you can show a little bit of interest and you can give that reason to come back. Because what do people leave with when they leave our businesses? You know, if you, if you pop into a shop on Bond Street, you get a nice big bag, <laughs> you know, and you have something to, to take home for, for all your money. But, you know, this awareness also that people pay a lot of money for our services. Mm. You know, it's not for free. It's not just out of the goodness of our hearts. There is a business behind it, but we owe people to leave feeling better and we owe people to have a reason to come back. And isn't it wonderful if people leave and they already think about when can I come back? Yeah. Because yeah. that was so good. So then it's, of course, a little bit of recording, you know, and data. And um, so I find that quite challenging because often all the good stuff is in people's head. You know, the memories of what worked for the Millers and what worked for the Smiths and yeah. what worked for the blah, blah, blah. Um, but, but if we write it down and if we have a good customer profile and if you remember a little bit what you did for someone before, and then you need to make a decision whether you repeat or whether you do something different in order not to repeat and surprise them again. Um, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Uh, <laughs> very much so, yes. Um, I mean, so, I feel like a lot of connection with our basic, brilliant basic I mean, magic it, touches. It, it feels quite is, familiar, yes, but on, exactly. a, on a smaller scale, perhaps. But um, yeah. I mean, according to our open table data, Thomas has been to Medler over 60 times. So you're a repeat, you're a repeat mm -hmm. customer. So. Yeah. But you see, like, I don't know that I feel as happy in any other restaurant in the same way like I do when we're at yours. You won't make David cry. <laughs> no, but you know, like, because you are act absolutely practicing everything that I sort of theoretically know or try to put into a concept or a strategy and try to communicate to people. But if you, the way... So, so, for example, familiar faces. I mean, Melania, you said at the beginning that you've been uh, with David for five years. Mm -hmm. So it's lovely to come back and see a familiar face. It's lovely mm -hmm. to be recognized. And that has nothing to do with like 
um, being desperate to, <laughs> you know, be talked about or to be recognized. That's not it. But of course, it's nice to go somewhere where you know people. And, and I mentioned the spirit of generosity before. I mean, you show that in so many ways. And again, if you have someone at the receiving end who really appreciates that, because I'm not, for, for me, this is not about freebies or for me, this is not a conversation as business people, how high was the complimentary bill mm -hmm. tonight? Yeah. That, that's totally not it. I mean, it really is about loving people and, you know, getting people to love us because if they like us, that's all good. If they respect us, that's all good. But ideally they love us, no? So, and they, they, they really appreciate what we do and, and want to come back. So I can only say chapeau, chapeau. 60 <laughs> times. Okay. That was easy. We can easily make that a hundred. <laughs> Then you're going to you. win an I award. I don't think that we've been to any other restaurant 60 times. That's amazing. Yeah, especially yeah. for everything that you've been saying, you know, like uh, I feel like it's, it's a big honor that you still come back to Medlar. But when you say you're looking at those standards, like all of them, and I can imagine maybe you go to a restaurant and do you actually, do you usually like to spot those things? They, I mean, I guess they come naturally and you spot them naturally. You but maybe you no, not at all, no. not at all, not anymore. Okay. So I think that was maybe something I did a long, long time ago, mm. and it was almost like a bit of a sporting game. But not anymore. Why would I? Yeah, you know, Metla is your business, and the Corinthia is mine. Yeah, and you do what you do, and when you come to mine, when you come to Corinthia, I hope you don't look. I hope you just come and you enjoy yeah. and you love it. And when I come to Metla, that's what I do. Yeah. Um. I. Why would I? And and also, like, it wouldn't even matter. <laughs> you know, if you're nice to people, who cares about a little, yeah. you know, a little hiccup yeah. here and there? And can I ask you something? Do you? Um, inspire like to other I mean for example you go to a, another beautiful hotel in the world do you take something back from an experience maybe that you can implement then into your in Corinthia as you have yeah happened? that I that I do a, a lot because whilst I'm not looking mm. I don't think you can uh you can't stop noticing yeah you know well, like well, I mean I notice well, and I see thing. it when, all when, but... when you visit other establishments you can't help but notice no. but sometimes you can be inspired by something and sometimes yeah, you exactly. learn what not to do but mm. I often find going to a five-star hotel like like the Corinthia you you do learn little details that you can implement into 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 our business um for sure yeah. but you're not necessarily looking like Thomas said but you, you just noticing yeah yeah, hundred percent. I mean, you. I, I notice all the time, and when, when I travel, I also like to go to other nice places. Or like next week, for example, we have a sales trip coming up, and I will be a few days in Los Angeles and in New York, and I can't wait. I hope that I get my New York fix and that I come back with some <laughs> incredible ideas and experiences because they do it a little bit different to to how we do things so one like it's also the resort hotels you know they of course operate in totally different to city hotels so if you i don't know if you notice but in our reception area there's like a big cart like a, like a trolley and we called it carson and the idea of carson came about that when you go on holiday and when you check into a resort i mean the first thing they do is they extend a gesture of hospitality to you Whereas in a city hotel, of course, you get a lovely little welcome and we help you out of the taxi and we help your bags. But it goes into the formal process pretty quickly. You know, the checking in, the name, the reservation, the credit card and so on. Whereas when you, I don't know where you fly to, where would we love to fly to? Say the Maldives. Yeah, like when you land in the Maldives and you check into your incredible hotel first, they welcome you, you know, and they show you the view and they give you a towel and they give you a drink or a water or whatever. But only then do they come to this sort of more formal oh. part of the check-in. So, and this is how Carson was born because we were thinking like, what, how can we extend a gesture of hospitality? So we created this card so that people people's attention is maybe drawn to it visually or oh, what's that it's a talking point it's a narrative and then there is always a seasonal gesture of hospitality on there so in 
May, June, it would maybe be some strawberries or in the autumn, it would maybe be a little ginger and lemon mm. shot or whatever it may be. Like I, um, it's, it's never massively sophisticated, but it's a little something where we can say, hey, help yourself. Mm. I love that. Yeah. So in terms of the Corinthia, do you have, um, like, for example, our philosophy at Medler is brilliant basics and magic touches. Um, oh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've noticed on your your card, your, your card, it says, uh, shine your heart out. Is that your motto philosophy or is that something else? <laughs> oh, this, is, uh, this is the card that I wrote for you at, at the table. Um, so so that's, that's not one of our yes. mottos. Um, but we do uh, love to write cards. So yes. I feel in a luxurious grand hotel to you know, maybe uphold a few old school standards is um, it's not a bad thing. You know, mm -hmm. a little bit of etiquette mm -hmm. and a little bit of the good old days. And if you then de de deliver this in, an, in, a, in, in, in a way that feels off today um, and, and not old and boring, um, then that's something nice. And handwriting... Um, and writing cards and uh, welcoming people with a card or a personal note or a thank you card is part of this. So we have a few cards. We have also we have a one in a million. We have a shine your heart out, and then they're little. If you come more, you'll get the whole okay. whole array of cards. <laughs> I soon have to come up with a few new ones. I feel. But do you have a general? And philosophy then of course or? it needs to be written with ink. Yeah, has okay. to be has to be fountain pen and ink. It's a old school touch there. Yeah, it's like it's a little Let's detail. Get, no? uh -huh. mm. Do you know these handwritten cards that are pre-printed? So this is, for example, something I do. If I get yeah. a handwritten card, I <laughs> quickly lick my tongue a little bit and I see, is it really written or is it just no. printed in a handwritten way? So a no. little, yeah, well. Oh, a lot, a lot. Yeah, like, I mean, you know how many welcome cards we write every day? So the hotel on average has about 100 arrivals, 100 departures. I don't yeah, write yeah. them all myself. Thank God my team is helping. Yeah. <laughs> but I would never have a pre-printed card that looks handwritten. Yeah, you know, yeah. if it's pre-printed, that's fair and enough, but then just print it. Yeah, yeah no. <laughs> Incredible. There you go. A little secret. Thomas, moving on to the yes. non-negotiables. We're working for oh, yeah, you. So what are your non-negotiables? Hmm. You want the whole list? <laughs> well, this is the same answer I, that they gave. I couldn't even gave. do my list because it was too long. But I thought anyway. you were different, Thomas. <laughs> Let's say three main ones. Sometimes. Well, like uh, non-negotiables. Uh, you know, I think we all strive for perfection, and mm. I think because of it, it's it's not easy to deliver perfection because we're also not uh, scientists. You know, we're mm. hospitality people. Um, but I think it's a non, so one of the non-negotiables would be that you have to try, mm -hmm. you know, and you have to have commitment to the course. Um, if, I mean, if any of my team listens to this, they will start rolling eyes now. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, mistakes can happen. But um, if they happen because we weren't focused or because we weren't precise or we didn't try, then they are unforgivable. Mm -hmm. You know, there needs to be a lot of pride behind what we do and pride in our job, you know? So, and here comes the story because how many British Airways planes are landing every day? You know, those pilots can't say, see, forgot to put the wheels out, yeah. you know, little plane crash, <laughs> you know, or the surgeons in our hospitals, like they can't, f you know, forget tools in the body. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, when there are many, many professions where mistakes aren't acceptable, so why would they be acceptable in our world? So if they then happen, fair enough, we learn from them, we move on, and, and thank God we're not in a, uh, you know, British yeah. Airways environment and we're not crashing planes, but that doesn't make it acceptable that we allow them to happen. We should do absolutely everything to, to, be, to be flawless. So that would be one. I hate dishonesty. 
So mm-hmm. honesty, I think, is really, really important. If somebody works in our team, you know, tell the truth. Yeah, I mean, what's more to say? No, honesty is honesty. So that I find uh, quite important. And something that I really like is loyalty. So um, I know you can't have all your colleagues and all your employees forever. But I think I'm I'm quite a loyal person. So I, of course, totally appreciate loyalty back. And I like it when the team feels strong and feels together and um, that you can sort of rely on each other and you know each other. And um, yeah. Hmm. So those are quite, um, so those are the first three out of 30. (laughs) (laughs) My God. So I think they're probably quite important. Yeah. Okay, quick fire questions. Yeah, shall we? Else you want to ask? Oh, good. Okay. I think uh, we think we got a lot today. Yeah. Um, ready for a quick fire round? Well, I hope so. Like, I mean, it's like it's going to be things. much easier than anything has been just said <laughs> yeah? and asked. Okay, like go for it then. Like, this what is, is, the is it like? Part, is, it, actually... is it McDonald's or Burger King type <laughs> question? Well, actually, actually, there is one similar, which is what does your lazy dinner look like? If you're at home, just. I would like you to answer with one word, one brief sentence. Okay. And what would your lazy dinner be? Pasta. Wow. Oh, I, I thought you I wanted a one word answer. <laughs> no, I mean, you say pasta, I'm Italian, I need a list. Uh, are you Italian? Yes. Okay, so okay. like, I mean, anything, anything pasta. Um, anything. But I do love a proper carbonara. Oh, yeah, me too. Proper one. Yeah, like I don't need to explain to you how that <laughs> no, looks exactly like. No, exactly not. Let's not get into the conversation. M- mine is extremely good. <laughs> Okay. Well, if <laughs> or you do one a simple catre e pepe, or even like I love a bolognese, like anything pasta, really. But I'm not talking like complicated raviolis. No, like you asked oh. for like a lazy dinner yeah, at exactly. home. Yeah, okay. love sushi, all of this. Uh, sushi, I don't make myself, to be honest. But I love cooking. Yeah, <laughs> there, there was but my one-word answer. Bring, you see how good I am at one-word <laughs> answers. Bring you to Medler one day a carbonara yeah. if you got some spare. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, what is your favorite book? So I, you see, th- those are really difficult questions, like the favorite color, the favorite book, the favorite song. But um, I have to say that one book I read um, lately fascinated me uh, called Unreasonable Hospitality. Okay. And it's by um, someone who I like a lot and who I got to know fairly well over the years. It's um, Will Gidara, who um, mm-hmm. probably came to fame with everything he did, but then, uh, of course, was heavily involved in Eleven Madison Park. And before that, I also loved this book by Danny Meyer, Setting the Table. And, um, you, you, you know, so I, I just feel like I encourage everyone to read those books. I think setting yeah. the table, I think, is still relevant and unreasonable yeah. hospitality, I think, is just a fascinating read. Yeah. And um, where did you experience the best service? Medla. Thank you. <laughs> Finally, someone One says. word. <laughs> no explanation <laughs> needed. It. That's the best word I've had. I mean, <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. Then, Not um, lying. What... Um, who is the person in the industry that you admire the most, if there is one? Admire. Gosh, admire is a strong word. I learned, I learned a lot from my previous boss, Stephen Alden, who was the CEO at Maybourne and went on to different ventures. So that's definitely someone who I, um, who I very, very respectfully look up to. Um, who has a mind that uh, works in a fascinating way. And I re- enjoy the relationship more and more because now we became friends. Yeah, no, no So more. I miss those converta- conversations. He, he lives in Italy now, so oh, really? I, I don't see him often enough. I see. And outside the industry, is anyone that you look up to? You mean a politician? <laughs> well, can... No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, 
I don't, I, I don't know. Um, I, I mean, there are some incredible actors, of course. There are some incredible performers. You know what I like is if people mm. are still relevant. I mean, like she might be a bit bonkers today, but I remember growing up with Madonna. You know, I was 12 and the woman was cool and now she's still around. So I don't know if I approve of her just as much nowadays that I used to do. But um, I, I, I do like uh, people who sort of looked at doing things properly. Like if you if you look at act, actors, like if you look at a Meryl Streep, for example, who, who did some incredible movies, who has reached a certain age, who is one of the greatest. So... You know, that's probably deep inside um, a little worry I have. Like, you don't want to ever be an ornament, do you? Mm. You know, and if you pro as you progress in life, and I really don't feel that I have reached this stage, <laughs> but um, but you do. I, I think relevance and uh, understanding what's happening today and what's going on in the world is like really important. Do you see the hotelry word? This is not a well. A one word answer. No, I, don't, like, I only answered one of your questions with one word. Do you remember the question? It was the most important. It was the most important, it was the most okay. important question. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I mean, to see if you see the utility word like evolve and how do you see evolving in the next few years? So I think we haven't um, quite reached the consistent level of personalization yet. Um, I think people people will pay more and more attention to it. I think people are fascinated in our world, you, you know, because it's part of their day-to-day -day life. And we work in it, but they consume it. So um, I, I feel... You know, many years ago, they, they they learned everything about design, you know, so mm -hmm. this card we can't really have up our sleeve anymore because all these designers that we use have designed their homes by now. Then they were all into lighting, you, you know, and now they analyze our light settings. So then, you know, like they were really super interested in wines, but now it's not only the, 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 the job of a sommelier gets more and more difficult, you know, because everyone has been to the vineyard and met the winemaker. So, so, and so on and so forth. So, like it's a really the chefs you know everybody knows all the chefs has the cookbooks and and performs what they normally used to do at their own dinner parties so i feel that self-care and well-being and trying to be your best self will move more and more into our hands and into our business and i think that's where it's going that people are really very much in touch with themselves and wanting a small bespoke luxury experience which was highly personalized and, and you, yeah do you do you see how that do you see that's the way service is going as well because i mean i, I guess quite a while ago and, and the skills are you, you don't see them very often anymore things like geridon service were very important at one point mm. whereas now all the skill seems to be in in how you can read the customer and deliver this bespoke experience like you're saying mm. yeah um I think you're right. I think it's 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 going that way. And um, I think people like us at this point, I come back to my little old school. So Guéridon service, for example, I think is absolutely one of those elements that we should uphold. Mm -hmm. I think it's part of our industry and it's beautiful. You know, like seeing people working table side. However, our job is to deliver it in an of today way. And the way I would look at Guéridon service is that it's a vehicle to deliver a personalized experience. You know, in the past, you would maybe have had people who don't say a word and they're totally focused on their wild duck or chicken or Dover sole or whatever it is that we're doing or carving a salmon or preparing a tartare. And everybody would just look at the technical performance of what's happening on that Guéridon, but there would be silence. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's an incredible opportunity to spend a little bit of time at the table and engage a bit in a conversation and talk to people about the produce or, or whatever they want to talk about. I mean, this is where the personalization kicks in. But from our point of view, look, I mean, that gives us three minute airtime with the guest mm -hmm. instead of 10 seconds dropping a plate. So I love Geridon service, not nonstop, not yeah. for every course, but yeah. you know, like if one touch point throughout the service is something like this, I think it's a really good opportunity towards the future. Amazing. Very nice. Yeah. 
I think we can wrap up. Yeah, we? well, thank you for your time today, Tom. Thank well, that so flew much. by. That thank you. Amazing. No, I really enjoyed thank being you. here with you. Thank you. Thank you for this. So you have a table for two on Saturday at 7.30. <laughs> this is the 61st <laughs> visit. We, we will create one. The, uh, thank song. you so much uh, for having me, thank honestly. You. Thank you. Thank you. It was brilliant. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for listening to Drive for Service podcast. Follow us on Instagram at Medlar Chelsea and make sure you like and subscribe for future episodes.